Hey everyone, I'm Mike from Hatchville, and I'm one of the mechanical engineers and partners here. And today we're going to be doing an exciting teardown on a product called the Playdate. Uh, the Playdate is a mobile game console that has a crank on it, aside from the fact that it closely resembles the form factor of a Game Boy, just different proportions. So I'm really excited to show you the inners and the inner workings once we do the teardown. So let's take a look at it. All right, let's get this thing out of the box and take a look at it. First thing you see is the game console presented in a EVA foam, and then next to it you have the USB charging cable. From what I hear, the, the battery charge can last up to a few days. The screen is not lit and it's not a touch screen, but to unlock it, double click on this button here that wakes it up. The fact that it's not backlit with an LED, it's just a black and white LCD display, gives it that energy efficiency and it doesn't drain your battery. That's the crank that you fold out. It's nicely done. Um, this is a partnership, a collaboration between Panic and Teenage Engineering. Really nice finishes on here. As you can see, there's a very, very nice, satisfying detent click at each discrete location that opens 180 degrees from the closed position to the open position. And very responsive too. You can hear a, an acoustic feedback, but no tactile feedback. Now that we have the product out of the box, let's remove some of the screws and take a look inside. I'm curious to see what we learn, but taking a closer look at these screws and the overall build construction is really nice. Uh, I would say, if I were to guess, this is either aluminum or stainless steel on the crank arm. And then the screws themselves, they look like stainless steel, but they, they're, they're custom screws. There's bosses on both sides. One is obviously female and the other is male threaded. But the, the design element here is that there's the, the screws themselves are hollow all the way through. So you can see right through the posts of the screws. So let's get this removed. I like the, uh, the deboss on the branding and then there's some silk screening on the back that shows the model number of the play date and where it was manufactured, FCC regulation, uh, licensing, there's CE as well. And then some instructions on how to dispose it because it has a battery in it. Um, you'll want to dispose of it properly. Okay, just my quick observation here is that the, the front cover plate goes over the side, so you don't necessarily see the parting line. The, the back cover, it's inset into the front cover case. So in addition to the screws, you also have snaps along the flats of each side. This is for obvious reasons, right? Because you have fasteners in four corners. You wanna be able to manage and maintain the, the gap that you get along the, the flat sides and to prevent separation. And voila. As a part like this, it's really difficult to maintain flatness across a flat surface. All right, well, inside, um, immediately you see the PCB board that's fastened down and then you have a, a large battery pack. 760 milliamp hours, 3.7 volt, 2.812 watt hours. It takes up about 40% of the volume within the case. And then as far as the crank goes, there, there are detents like I mentioned. So there's probably a spring in the crank handle um, that pushes upon a ball. The ball bearing makes contact with each side of the detent. So that gives that nice registration. All right, now that we have the back cover off, um, and we've observed the, the metal plate on the back side of the cover. Let's go a little deeper. Let's peel the first layer of onion off. This is very, very delicate and very thin. So even the screws are very flat, uh, short. So I want to be very careful because I want to keep, I want to maintain the function of the device. So already a good sign that they're using the right screws because these are called plastite screws. Um, you tell by the thread the coarseness of the thread. They're designed for threading into plastic. Things you want to be careful or the things you want to watch out for um, where some companies cut corners are using sheet metal screws to thread into plastic. It's just a different pitch. With plastite screws, they're actually, they have three lobes to them. Once you have the, the hole in the plastic tuned to the right size, the threads in the screws cut through the plastic and provide 
the threads. There's one more part that I need to remove. So there's an inner cage held on by these screws. The inner cage looks like it's what's holding on or keeping the subassembly together. So there are buttons, there are ribbon wires that's holding the entire assembly together. Very delicate structure. This is as far as you want to go before we begin to destroy things. So there's a couple of things I want to talk about. There is this plastic spring bar here that, that gives this button a spring force. So it gives it a nice, like increases the force for pushing onto this button. This is a, an easy way and a nice sleek way of doing it because for one, it reduces the, the amount of labor that's required to assemble a spring. And secondly, the piece of plastic is free. It, you can put it as, I mean, it, it'll be formed as part of the mold when you injection mold it. So it's a nice integrated feature for providing more spring force um, for this external button. Nice feature there. Good job, Teenage Engineering. Um, and then this inner chassis, it's a really nice sub-assembly because it enables the installers or assemblers to be able to install the, uh, the PCB board, the battery, and then you make the final attachment through the ribbon cables to the LCD screen, LCD display underneath. It's a nice, nice sub-assembly. So let's go ahead and reassemble all the screws. Someone with even thicker hands can manage to uh, can cause damage to some of the components. One thing I noticed is that as as I was removing this inner sub-assembly, what I what I imagine they could be done is there could be a snap feature that snaps the button assembly onto the front case. Same with the, the keypad. It's on a flexure system, so maybe there's a way that could be heat staked so it doesn't get lost or misaligned. The screws feel like they're aluminum. All right, so I retract my comment that I said that the screws are aluminum because this could be a Hall effect sensor for all I know or an optical encoder, but there's a magnet there that is, is attracting the screw, which tells me there's it's a steel screw. One feature that I wanted to point out when I get to it is that the hollow screws that I mentioned earlier, uh, what's preventing them from rotating as you unscrew or, or tighten the screw is a, is a D flat. So basically the cylinder has a flat, has a flat side to it here. And that registers with a flat on the plastic case. So as you're tightening the screw on the opposite side, it prevents this flange nut from rotating. We'll do a quick check to make sure that everything, the function check, that still works. All right, that works. Let's get this back together. This brings back some nostalgia because it reminds me a lot like the, the Game Boy, the first Game Boy, the mobile console that ever came out, or a mobile gaming device that had the cartridge that you, you slide in and out. Um, except, who needs cartridges now when you have built-in memory? And the only difference is that I like the Game Boy form factor because it's, it's more ergonomic. Um, although, you know, it does resemble the buttons and, uh, you know, the AV button and the keypad and the screen, it's, it's just in a different form factor. The, the overall ratio is just different. It kind of reminds me of the Game Boy Color where you had the flip system. Uh, it's like a flip phone that flipped open. You had the, the keypad on the bottom and then I think it had a split screen too. I don't, I can't remember, but it was Game Boy Color. And you had the keypad on the bottom and the screen on top and it was just had a more ergonomic feel to it. Now it's like, I, I think I'd have to hold it like this, like a Blackberry to be able to control it. This is a really nice feature though. Let's take a second to talk about overall fit and finish. Um, whenever there's thin wall plastic like this, I mean, this looks like about a millimeter thick. Um, I like to see how rigid the entire structure is and see if it makes any noises in between parts. Um, and here when I'm squeezing the edge, there's actually a little bit of play um, where the thin wall on the top edge of the front cover flexes a little bit. It's less noticeable on the other sides, but most prominent on the top. In terms of feel, they got the 
the recess feature is pretty nice. There's not like a noticeable edge that you feel because this is such a tactile product, right? You, you hold it in your hands and you're feeling all the sharp edges and the corners. There's no haptic feedback. Another thing is that they've replaced any haptics with acoustic feedback. As you would expect from uh, Teenage Engineering, you know, they, they're known for designing music synthesizers and equipment. So this is, this definitely has that DNA built into it. Well, there you have it. The Playdate is fully reassembled and fully functional. I think some areas that might have felt short is, I'd say they could have pulled the microphone and the back button, or maybe off to the side. By moving the speaker, the back button, and the screw hole, you end up with a wider screen. I think this concludes our teardown and product analysis for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If there's any product that you guys would like to see in the future, let us know in the comments below. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Turn on your notification bell for future videos. And until then, let's hatch awesome. Yeah.